Well, good afternoon. It's good to be here with everyone. Um, I want to begin by uh, introducing a special person in the room today. Bill Underwood is the director of the Kent State University Press at Kent State. And uh, he has uh, a bunch of uh, books in the back that I'm sure he would like not to take home. So if, uh, before we disperse for the day, uh, Will will be in the back and uh, will be available to share what he has, which is the focus of today's uh, presentation. I should also mention that Will is a member of the Kent Rotary Club. So uh, you're among friends. Um, how many uh, in the room came to Lima after July 1998? All right, so there's about a dozen people in the room that were here before that date. But you may not, and while you may know what was in the press, you may not know the rest of the story. And that's really what we're here about today, is the rest of the story. Um, Professor Perry Bush spent more than a decade uh, researching and writing so that our community, but more importantly, so that the world, literally the world, could know uh, what went on and what was the rest of the story. Uh, Perry, uh, Professor Bush, is a history professor at Bluffton University. He got his uh, bachelor's in political science at University of California at Berkeley. Um, he got his PhD in history uh, from Carnegie Mellon in um, 1990. And uh, the title of his dissertation was Drawing the Line, American Mennonites, the State and Social Change. 1935 to 1973. American Mennonites. Mm. There will be a theme here. <laughs> Later on, uh, Professor Bush was also uh, published uh, a, a volume through Johns Hopkins called Two Kingdoms, Two Loyalties, Mennonite Pacifism in Modern America. And then finally, uh, he also uh, published at Kent State um, Dancing with the Kobzar, Bluffton College, and Mennonite Higher Education, which is the volume that I have here. And it's when I was having lunch one day with um, President Lee Snyder at uh, Bluffton that she uh, handed me this book and said uh, she wanted to make a little gift, and, and I obviously accepted it, and later on was leafing through it and discovered a style of presentation and a storytelling ability that was really wonderful. So while I think you can ultimately appreciate the storytelling ability, um, the amount of work that Professor Bush invested in this project to move from a focus on the Mennonite communities, literally from around the world and their impact in our region, to beginning to tell the story of an oil refinery and the oil business was a, a great transformation. And I think that uh, uh, for him, it was uh, an education, as I believe the book will be for all of us and all of you. So it's my pleasure today to introduce to you Professor Perry Bush. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Dave Ruger, for your gracious introduction. Thanks to the Lima Rotary Club for hosting me. Um, before I, I want to do some people myself, um, I have a table full of my colleagues and, and compatriots from Bluffton come down here. Um, uh, Hans Hushauer is here, who most of you may even know Hans, our Director of Advancement. Uh, Robin Bolas from our Public Relations, Director of Public Relations at the college, is here. Um, Mary Ann Sullivan, my long-term colleague at, in the English department at, at Lupton is here. And then um, I have to be on my best behavior because my boss is here. Uh, Sally Weaver Summer, the academic dean, my good friend and my boss, Sally Weaver Summer. And also my wife, Alicia, is here. And I want to make sure. Now, I myself am not a Rotarian, but I want you to know I'm doing my best to fit in. Um, since we're talking about ties, I don't know if you all can see in the back, I'm wearing my California Golden Bear tie today. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> given what happened to my bears in the fourth quarter, 
down there in Columbus on Saturday, I, and decide, I decided to wear it out of fidelity to my alma mater and also to demonstrate my solidarity with the oppressed. Yeah. <laughs> they found a way, didn't they? My bears, Jesus. Um, I am I'm delighted to be with you today to talk about um, this book, really for the first time, in the city of Lima. It's the most appropriate place I can think of for having a, a public conversation about the story that this book tells. No, I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it a bit unnerving to tell this story in this setting. I, um, uh, I, you know, I've, I'm a historian. I don't usually write about events 10 years ago. And um, so it's a little discomforting to be telling this story and talking about this book in the presence of some of the actors and actresses in it. You know, not only, of course, the mayor is here, and not only, you know, Ju Judy Gilbert's here, Ken Belcher, I think, is supposed to be here, Hans Hushar is here, Howard Elstrow, Marty McDonald, and others of you who, who I've not met, but who appear as characters in this narrative. And all of you would have, would have insights into my story and a depth of knowledge about it that, that have escaped me. So it's a little, it's kind of weird to do this, all right? And given, given that dynamic, it's not a story that I can just stand up here and narrate in some kind of clinical, abstract, academic way. I mean, here we are in downtown Lima, Ohio, and I'm going to tell you a story about this city. <clears throat> in the presence of the, some of the people who made it happen. And that's a great story, it's a happy story. It's a story where, every, where the good guys win. In fact, everybody wins in this story. And because of that, and because of the context in which we live, this particular Lima story is a unique one on the la larger landscape of deindustrializing America. For a great many cities and communities around the country and around the world, really, this has become a relatively bleak and barren terrain where happier endings are harder to achieve. And I can't talk about this, again, as some kind of academic abstraction. If you want a concrete manifestation of the happy ending of the story, when you leave here at 1 o'clock, just go down South Metcalf Street to where that ends, right? And there is a huge industrial complex there, what is today the Husky Oil Refinery. And by the logic not of Husky, but of its longtime corporate owner, British Petroleum, BP, that plant should no longer exist. But for the efforts of some of the people in this room, it would not exist. And at best, what we would have down there is a fenced-off former industrial area, in worst case, a brownfield, a huge open ecological sore. And how that achievement, how that little miracle happened is a great story. And back in a decade ago, I realized all I had to do was just tell this story. And that's what I want to do with you today in my next 20 minutes, in spite of the fact that most of you already know it. Right? I, want to, I want to talk, do three things. I want to talk about the odds you faced, uh, and saving that refinery. I want to talk to you about uh, how you did it, and I want to talk to you most importantly about why it matters. And I know, I know I'm an unlikely narrator of that account. For the past quarter century, I have been working diligently in the small field of, of Mennonite history, and I would guess that very few Mennonite historians have shifted over to publish uh, from that area in areas like oil refining and urban economics. In fact, I suspect I'm the only one to do this. And so I've been bluffing, people have been scratching their heads, really asking, you know, why are you doing this? So I can tell you how I got involved. About, I don't know, 2000, 2001, I got a call from a woman in my office who identified herself as Secretary of Mayor of Lima and was wondering if I'd be willing to come down and talk to the mayor about a project that he had in mind. And I had no idea what, what he was about and what he was interested in, so I said, sure, I'd come. So I, I knocked off between classes of the afternoon, I drove down here, and went into the mayor's office in, in the town square and, and sat down on his sofa in his office. He started talking, and he talked, and he talked. And at one point, I remember he was pacing back and forth in front of me, uh, telling the story, talking about how the city had just finished an amazing roller coaster ride uh, trying to save. They're one of its leading industrial employers, right, that had been here for a century. You know, you know, the, the, the refineries on the city line is blank. And um, I'm sitting there thinking, hey, this is interesting, but, but how does this involve me? I, I, only, I only knew something about this vaguely. I'd been preoccupied with trying to get tenure up there. And um, <laughs> I hadn't been much involved. And um, finally he turned to me and he said something like, you know, this is a fabulous story. And I think you should write it up. And I remember clearly what I told him. I said, Mr. Mayor, that's all very flattering and it's an honor, but, but you know, you should, that's a job for a journalist. I'm, I'm just an historian. And he said, I know, but I, I read your stuff. And he points to the Kobzar book, and he says, I think you could do it. And so I told him I would think about it. I went back to Bluffton and told him I would think about it. 
And the more I looked into it, the more I thought I would be crazy not to tackle this. It quickly became clear to me that the mayor was actually right. This is a great story. It had all, it had all the great elements of a great story. An alluring set of central protagonists, a fascinating setting, a blow-by-blow -blow series of events that led to climax and a resolution. But best of all, the more I read, the more I realized that the story really had two more very alluring aspects to it. First of all, it was clear to me that at its heart, it was a story about the power of moral action in the world. <clears throat> it's about the power of moral action in the world. In fact, it asks the central question that haunts anybody who lives in the old industrial Midwest. All around the world, there are corporate executives who are looking at reams of financial data. They've got a lot of spreadsheets in front of them. And no matter how their <coughs> advertising executives may portray their particular corporate persona, or no matter how these CEOs may understand their social roles, and many of them do have profound social roles, legally, they're only accountable to those spreadsheets. And on the basis of those spreadsheets, they have to make decisions whether to open a plant here or close one there, whether to move a facility from one community to another one half a world away, where the hand of governmental regulation is the lightest and labor is the cheapest. And those decisions, of course, are critical for the communities where they operate. And, and they raise some fundamental questions for those communities. Namely, do we have any say? Do we have any agency left? In an era of deindustrialization, in an era of globalization, can we still imagine ourselves as masters of our own fates? And the more I looked into this story here in Lima, the more I realized that if we can if we take Lima as a case study, the answer to those questions was yes. It's yes. And it also was clear to me that this story had a second great thing going for it. It had a great plot line. It's a kind of plot line that everybody loves. Kind of like kind of like Cal against Ohio State. You know, it's, 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 it's David versus Goliath. And um, let me describe those central protagonists. First in a the general theoretical way, and then in the context here in Allen County. On one hand, we have Goliath. We have global multinational corporations, which have, of course, immense financial and personal resources and the ability to command politicians, but they also enjoy an immensely privileged place in American law, corporate law, and history. In 1886, the United States Supreme Court issued the bizarre but um, foundational legal ruling, the Santa Clara decision, which established in law that corp the, the corporations are real persons by the virtue of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Now, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution had been passed about a dozen years before, primarily to clarify the status of recently freed slaves, and thus establish the normative definition of American citizenship. And corporate lawyers quickly used the Santa Clara decision to induce, cor to do in to induce courts to strike down hundreds of laws regulating corporations and in other ways restricting the autonomy they enjoyed as real persons. By 1973, half a century later, of all the cases invoking the Santa Clara decision, a half century after its establishment, over one half of all those cases did so on behalf of extending rights to corporations, and less than one half of one percent of those rulings involved the issue of racial justice. In recent decades, corporations have used the Santa Clara decision to appropriate, many, appropriate to themselves many of the other constitutional protections commonly awarded real living beings, like us. Right? And the Blotty decision, the Massachusetts Supreme Court, this is affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court, the Blotty decision, the corporation said that we're, we're people in the 14th Amendment, we have the right to contribute to political campaigns. Right? Dodge E. Ford, in 1919, the Michigan Supreme Court said a corporation existed primarily to, exi uh, uh, to enrich its shareholders, but this is its essential purpose. Right? And so right there you see the fundamental contradiction at the heart of this ruling, of this trajectory. Uh, and any corporate action, said Dodge B. Ford, aimed at any other end, namely to soften the effects of plant closings on partner communities, for instance. That was a, technically a violation of corporate charters and purposes. The only, and, and this is, you know, Milton Friedman, Nobel Prize winning economist, he put it best. He said, the only, one and only social responsibility of business, he said, is to increase its profits. Well, thus, in the field of corporate law, corporations have come to possess capacities that are nearly cosmic in nature. These are really big and powerful Goliaths, right? They have every right that real U.S. citizens enjoy, but at the same time, they're something like super persons. They may be persons in law, but they can officially feel no human emotions like guilt or shame. They can devour one another. And also, if it suits their interests, break apart like amoebas and reconstitute themselves oceans away, all right? Most of all, unlike 
real living beings, like, like all of us, who inhabit particular communities, who have moral responsibilities to our neighbors and moral obligations to our neighbors, legally at least, corporations are not bound by those kinds of factors. Now, I want to be clear, before I go any further, that I don't see corporate executives or corporations as some kind of innately evil entities. Clearly, they have the capacity to bring jobs and economic development to communities, which of course means bringing life to communities. And communities, including this one, readily go through fantastic exertions to attract them and to make them happy and induce them to stay. Right? And without them, we wouldn't have a tax base. We wouldn't be able to fund our schools. They're not evil. And corporate executives are not wicked by their very nature. In fact, through the 1980s, the more I learned then, I mean, I didn't get a lot of this in Manite history classes, right? I, I learned a lot in doing this book, right? And um, they're operating in immensely competitive environments. Through the 1980s, corporate America underwent a profound period of restructuring, marked by a series of leveraged buyouts and hostile takeovers. I mean, it was a deeply uncertain time to corporate heads. The message had been sent out to business CEOs, either act boldly or lose your job. In the words of one corporate theorist, um, Marjorie Kelly, uh, and a revolution in corporate governance emerged that fed a new ruthless <coughs> search for profits. In the words of one corporate theorist, Marjorie Kelly, they either had to, quote, start bringing every dime from operations, sending jobs overseas, selling off weak divisions, laying off thousands, or be taken over by someone who would. Right? And it's only in this context where we can talk about the actions of BP here in Lima. And we forget this because BP has had, had a rough go recently in the international press, right? <coughs> But BP, historically, going back to its days as a quasi-official arm of the British Empire, had a deep sense of corporate social responsibility, a deep sense, right? And a sense of, and remarkable pattern generosity to their part of the industry. And we forget that, because, you know, we know what happened in the Gulf. But BP has, and, and, and a deep commitment to moral action in the world. Now, they were also torn. I mean, the BP, by the, by the last couple of decades, is almost a schizophrenic kind of corporation, because they also... Um, we're, we're deeply focused on the profits above all else mentality. And we have these two parts, chewing at BP, right? And we've seen what happened when the second part overtakes the first, right? They neglect the safety culture. And we had terrible, tragic events like what happened in Prudhoe Bay, and then as refineries in Texaco City, and then of course what happened with Deepwater Horizon Rig, right? Um, but before this, BP had a sterling international reputation as a progressive corporation whose CEO, John Brown, was going around the world making speeches to outfits like Greenpeace, right? Claiming responsibility for global warming, calling his fellow corporate executives to be progressive. So it's that kind of context that situates BP's actions here in Lima in such deep irony. And again, BP, even when they were going to leave, they were going to fund the United Way for how many more years, they are going to pay their taxes for years after they were going to go, right? Again, this is not some evil outfit. So that's, that's Goliath. Let's talk about the Davids in this scheme. All right? Well, Davids don't have much power uh, against uh, this array of corporate uh, privileges. Uh, their powers are weak compared to state or national governments. Um, uh, and and uh, they, what can they do? Appeal to state officials? And they don't have the leverage of state officials that oftentimes corporations do. And they know that the, the repercussions of plant closings are severe, and we have people here from Allen County Children's Services, Scott and others, who can document those changes. You know what happens when plants close in your community. <coughs> Suicides go up, domestic violence goes up, uh, health-related pressures, high blood pressures, stress levels go up, rates of alcohol and drug abuse generally go up. Um, industrial communities experience their own set of, of internal crises related to the loss of tax income. Local schools go down, all right? U.S. Chamber of Commerce, estimates that for every two service sector jobs uh, uh, that are lost, no, every, every three manufacturing jobs that are lost, you lose two service sector jobs. So local business is something, right? In this manner, one political scientist has summarized, quote, private corporations have acquired the power to issue birth certificates and death sentences to retired communities. So there's, there's the odds that you're facing here in Lima in the mid-90s. And I, let's just talk about these two, these two powers. I mean, on one hand, Right? In 1996, when BP announced it was going to close the refinery, it stood as the world's fifth biggest oil company, uh, the largest corporation in Great Britain, and the most profitable oil company in the world. Um, in the United States alone, it would employ over 45,000 people, and those people would tend to be very good at their jobs. In 1996, the company's profits exceeded $4.1 billion. All right? Collectively, BP had power. On the other hand, in this corner, we have Lyme, Ohio. As a total population at that point, about 42,000 people. 
All right, served by a total workforce of about 450 people who managed to, in 1996, collect and budget a total tax revenue of about $46 million. And for three decades, this had been a city that had undergone a steady, nearly unrelenting battery with negative, ec negative economic forces. It had lost upwards of about 12,000 solid manufacturing jobs, the kind of jobs that, as you know, you built cities on, right? And it served as lifeblood to the community. Now in 1996, local residents faced the loss right, of one of the great emblematic industrial powers, their refinery. And they decided they were going to stop it. Collectively, Lyme had determination. And it would not be a balanced contest. But then you all know what happened. David squared off against the Goliath, and once again, David won. Lyme won. Uh, when BP said they were going to close the refinery, a tough little cast of characters said, no, you're not. In a remarkable series of developments, they resisted BP, stalled them, confronted them, and finally went around BP's back to secretly find a buyer for that facility, and, and everyone goes away a winner. BP walks away with a quarter billion dollars, Wimbo walks away having saved 500 jobs, and also a fair portion of its self-respect. There's the happy story. So, so how did you do it? Um, well, you have to read the book, but there's a, <laughs> there's a, a, lot of, a lot of, just some basic factors. Part of it is, of course, that Lima got lucky. That refinery produced something like 30% of all the gasoline sold in the state. When BP was going to close it, they had to figure out where they're going to get the gasoline and an alternative supply. And it took them a while to put that together. It took them about three years. And so uh, Lima had this little window of opportunity in which to work. And um, they kept plugging away. But they were also able to do it because of perseverance, some simple dogged perseverance. They were, able to, they were able to do it because they stuck together. I mean, I think about the heroes and heroines in the story. And um, we had a progressive social justice democratic mayor. We had conservative business leaders, a conservative set of county commissioners, right, and a very conservative local newspaper, right, all of whom put their, put their divisions aside, and they worked together to pull this off, right? Uh, remarkable kind of let's let's pull together what we can do. Most of all, you know how you did that. You know how you're able to say they're fine. I mean, you did it because you decided to do it. And, and look, this is the central part of the story. This is the central dynamic that appears over and over and over in that book. Here's my thesis. Show my thesis. Two simple points. First of all, that the actions of real people make the difference. And secondly, that corporations are not persons. Over and over and over, in spite of the overwhelming preponderance of power possessed by BP, that dynamic kept appearing. Even in an era of globalization, human initiative and human action and human energy still matter. Citizen action still works. When a major multinational corporation decides to throw a proud old industrial community into a post-industrial scrap heap, that community does not just have to go gently off into the good night. It can resist. Sometimes it can prevail, even in the face of long odds. That's what the story is here. Now I just have time for a few examples of the actions that real people made here. The first, of course, is the relentless civic activism of the mayor and others on the refinery task force he created, who kept saving, trying to save that refinery with a dogged determination. Even when it was clear it was hopeless. It was hopeless. <coughs> or for a better example, even, even a power, equally powerful example, Consider what was going on down at the refinery. In the early 1990s, um, BP uh, installed a new executive in charge of its two Ohio refineries, all right? a guy by the name of Jim Schaefer. All right? And they said, look, Jim, I interviewed uh, Jim Schaefer, a um, really thoughtful, insightful guy. And, and he, they said, look, we know this refinery is a loser here in Lima. We're good, probably going to have to shut it, but see if you can coax a few more bucks out of it before you do it. Right? And, um, uh, so people at the refinery, led by not just Jim Schaefer, but union leaders and the, the plant manager, Donovan Kunzley, all right, they all got together and they said, let's see if we can do it. Let's, let's coax some more profit out of this old machinery. And they did it by going to the workers and saying, look, how can we make this thing run more efficiently? And then immediately implementing their suggestions. And here are people who have been doing that work for decades, right? What works? And um, a remarkable series of developments. And again, you'll have to read the book. That it's, a, it's a great part of the story. But that plant quickly became one of the most fastest improving refineries in all of BP's world, so much so, and BP realized this, that they hired some local community activists, one of which was a PhD in anthropology by the name of Hans Huschauer, and they said, Hans, tell us what they're doing right there. Document it. Right? And they gave him a pot of money, went around and he figured out what they're doing. So BP could, could spread that to all parts of its empire. 
That's what was happening down there at the refinery. And the most remarkable part of the story is, even though it becomes clear that that refinery is going, it's gone, it's finished, it's archives, BP's going to close it. You know, most of us would just at that point throw up our hands and say, forget it, I'm just doing my nine to five. Even as the refinery got down to a skeletal workforce barely able to keep it alive, they kept improving it, they kept improving it, they kept improving it. So much so that later when David Stockman, among others, simply goes in there, he said, you know, Bob Payne, the, the Wall Street broker who expected, you know, who told me the story. He said, yeah, Stockman expected to find this outmodal dinosaur. Instead, he finds this superb plant. It's because of that that he wanted to buy in the first place. Human actions still matter. Human initiative and energy still matter. Right? Even in an era of globalization. Even at a time when it looks hopeless. All right? So, so that's, in effect, what the kind of odds you faced here. That's, in effect, um, how you did it. So let me ask, deal with the third question, then there'll be some time for some questions. All right? So, and the question, of course, is so what? Why does it matter? All right? It's one community saves one plant in the face of all these plant closings. You know, there are, there are labor industries, there are industry labor specialists, and they start counting plant closings. And when you start counting the number of plants that are closed, by the early 80s, you get to numbers like 100,000. 100,000 plants are closed across the whole industrial Midwest. Millions of jobs lost in sent overseas. And so, you know, you could ask a legitimate question. One community saves one plant in the face of 100,000 plants closed. So what? What's the big deal? Well, Lima's story, I think, matters because it shows that we are not fated to be helpless victims of large and personal economic forces. That's what, that's what you accomplished here. That's what you, that's what you proved here. Lima's story is significant because it illustrates that the actions of real people still matter in America and that corporations are necessary and we need them and they're powerful, but they are not persons. That's the moral of the entire story. That's the moral of the story. And so you think about that accomplishment against the backdrop of 100,000 plant closings and jobs being lost and communities going down. Well, what did you do here in Lima? You gave industrial communities across America and around the world Something like a bright and hopeful signal in a dark and troubled time. That's what you did. Friends, do you understand the kind of fundamental double standard that lies at the heart of corporate power in America? And in fact, I mean, do I have this right? I mean, look, I'm just a man of historian. Right? Tell me, do I have this right? Corporations say to local communities, you know, look, we're persons too, just like you. We have the same rights that every other American enjoys, including now the right. <coughs> As the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in its revolutionary Citizens United decision in January 2010, we have the right now to, to um, uh, flood the campaign coffers of politicians we favor with millions and millions and millions of dollars. And we, don't, we don't even have to tell you where the money comes from anymore. Right? Isn't that good for democracy in America? That would be. But when local communities come back to their corporate partners and they say, fine, that's fine, okay, you're people. Well, if you're people, you need to have the same moral standards that the rest of us do. You need to operate with the same moral obligations the rest of us do. And in fact, don't corporations say, look, look, we're operating in an amoral environment. Our only legal imperative is to pursue profits. It's not personal, it's business. You can't hold us to those standards. We're in an amoral marketplace. So maybe, friends, to preserve the health of our communities and the fundamental integrity of our democracy, those of us in those communities just need to respectfully say to our corporate partners, fine, we're glad you're here, but you can't have it both ways. I, I hope it, it, it uh, I want to leave time for questions. But I'm just going to, I hope it's not a spoiler if I read the last two paragraphs. Can I do that? For over a century now, the flat landscape of the old industrial Midwest has been burned by the movements of international capital. Indeed, in the fiery furnaces of the massive steel plants along rivers like the Monongahela and the Mahoney, or in the great cathedral hangar of the old Lima locomotive works, that burning occurred in quite a literal sense. The rivet guns are silent in Lima now, and smoke has long away cleared away from river valleys of Braddock and Youngstown. The fires have passed, the earth scorched, and Midwestern communities have been left to figure out paths to a different kind of economic future. As the industrial heritage of the old Midwest demonstrated repeatedly, however, fire could be a creative as well as a destructive force. Long before the arrival of Europeans, various key plants in the natural landscape of Northwest Ohio, such as several species of oak and the great savannas of Northwest Ohio, germinated, left, germinated best 
in the ash left by the great fires that periodically swept across the forest land before burning themselves out. In this, the fires left another aspect of the Midwestern heritage that is worth considering anew. Maybe from the scorched earth of the old industrial Midwest, new growth can spring forth once more. In this flat and creative landscape, fresh political options might be germinating that could reclaim an older democratic heritage. It's an ideology that was once held close by the founders of the Republic, who insisted that ordinary citizens, not economic machines, are sovereign in America. If such old roots were to sprout forth and blossom once again, they would have to emanate from a great many places across the country. But one of their most fertile hotbeds might be said one day to have been the still potent residue left by the great black swamp, the weathered gray streets of Lima, Ohio. Thank you all. It's been delightful. charge, but in my watch there's, there's time for comments and questions, and I, I expect there will be a bright audience, there will be lots of comments and questions, we have some, a few minutes. Yeah, David. <laughs> this, is a, this is a comment, not, not really a question. I want to applaud your wonderful narrative skills. Uh, it really is a page turner. Uh, but I also want to applaud your super use of metaphors, as in the paragraphs that you just now recited. Thank you very much. I've been teaching undergraduates for 25 years. You got to tell a good story. You're lost. You got to be entertained. You're lost. Thank you, Thank you David. That's nice. Are there any other questions for me? Yes, Chuck. Uh, I'd be interested in how you went about it. How long this took? How you went about it? Well, I, I was lucky in that a lot of the spade work had been done for me in that uh, American house that existed. Uh, some of you remember American House, and they had done a number of interviews with people. I was able to access those. I interviewed about 40 people myself, and you know, you always think I should have done more, should have done more, should have done more. There, there was a list of 100 people I could have interviewed, and I, you know, I have to think goes to press. You're always scratching stuff. He's well, I should have talked to so and so and so and so. But I did lots of oral interviews. Um, the the key people, the, the mayor was was willing to share with me city papers. Judy Gilbert shared with me some of her personal papers um, that were very very helpful to me. I don't know, you just, you just, yeah. I'm not a journalist, but it can't be that different than being a historian. You just kind of figure out what happened and follow, follow what happened and the, the rush of events. So Lyman News was critically important. Lyman News made this some, obviously a major focus of its effort. And then you were here. I mean, you remember story after story after story after story. In effect, be, becoming a, a, a progressive muckraking journal that the governor was reading, all right? That's how powerful and important the Lyman News was in the story. And for an historian coming afterwards, I mean, the mayor gave me all those stories on a CD. It was on the Lyman News' webpage, so he gave me on a CD. I had it on my computer in my office. So there were great sources here for me, and I was able to kind of figure it out. Any other questions? Everyone's interested in getting back to work. Thank you all. Oh, other question, yes. Was Steve Well ever identified? Was it equal ever been fun? Yes. Yes. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs>